auditorium with us. Well, it is the second week of Lent. Does everybody know what Lent is? Oh, yeah. Very good. Very good, Richard. Yeah, if you have a background in the Anglican, Lutheran, Methodist, or Catholic Church, then you know, you're already familiar with the practice of Lent. And although there's no biblical mandate to practice Lent, it does have a biblical inspiration. The practice comes from the 40 days of fasting that Jesus did in the wilderness prior to starting his ministry. It is therefore observed through likewise fasting or depriving ourselves in some capacity so that we might meditate and reflect and spend time in prayer for 40 days prior to Easter. Now, Jesus spent those days prior to his ministry, his preaching ministry in Israel, but Lent is not tied to Jesus' preaching ministry. It's tied to the end of his ministry, as I mentioned, to Easter, to the cross. In fact, Lent is to Easter what Advent is to Christmas. You know, it's the lead-up, it's the preparation it's a time of reflection before the event, a time of preparation to prepare ourselves to observe the movement of God. And to that end, Lent begins on what we call Ash Wednesday. And sometimes you'll see someone, a devout follower, and they'll mark their forehead with a cross of ash on Ash Wednesday. That's what that's for, as in repenting in ash and sackcloth. In case you've ever seen that, uh, this year, Ash Wednesday was February the 22nd. And Lent ends just before Easter that we could celebrate with joy and gratefulness all that Jesus did for us in Good Friday and taking upon himself, upon his body, the sins of all of us who have called on his name in dying for us on that cross. And in rising from the grave three days later, giving us the promise of everlasting life on that first Easter Sunday morning. Glory to God. And so we look forward to Easter because Easter is a time of great joy. Easter is the highlight of the Christian calendar. It's a time of great celebration. Praise the Lord. But Lent is not about that joy. Lent is about repentance. It's about repentance. Now, repentance isn't a word that you often hear in our society today. Repentance is, is, is the, it simply means the act of repenting. It means to repent to recognize our foolishness and our sin toward God and in sorrow for having disrespected Him as God Most High, as our Creator and as our Lord and as our King, we turn from our sin and we turn towards Him and we say, Lord, I'm sorry. We do an about face, a 180 degree turn as it is. And it's surprising we don't hear more about repentance, really, because repent is the first word of the Gospel. It's the first word of the gospel that John the Baptist preached as the last Old Testament prophet, and it is the first word of the gospel that Jesus Christ preached as the first New Testament prophet. And both of them started out their ministry saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. To repent is to prepare yourself to encounter God. To encounter God. Repentance is about that. It's about getting ready to meet God in all of His holiness, and in all of His glory. This morning, as we once again open the book of James and begin our study there, we're going to find James confronting us with this idea of repentance, with the idea of humbling ourselves before Him. But before we turn to the Scripture, once it, let us once again turn to Him in prayer. Father, as we open your word now, we once again are at that place where we recognize that your word has power. There's power in the word of God. There's power in the gospel. And Father, they're just words on pages, but as, you, as we read those words, your Holy Spirit takes them and applies them to who we are. You convict us, you change us, you mold us, and you shape us into more of the image of Jesus Christ. Father, have your way with us today. We've already welcomed you in this place, and we've welcomed you to do your work in our lives. Father, do that work now as we open the Scripture and as we go through this, Father, that we would leave here a changed people, more like you than we've ever been before in our entire lives. And to that we give you praise. Amen. Amen. Well, open your Bibles if you have them with you. There's a pew Bible ahead of you if you didn't bring one, or navigate there in your device, as the case may be, to the book of James. 
Over the last eight weeks, we've been unpacking this epistle, this short letter that James, the brother of Jesus Christ, wrote to Christians who had moved to various different places around the world. To those scattered among the nations, as he puts it in verse 1. The book of James is a book written to those who know God. We have to recognize that. It's written to those who know God. It's to encourage authentic faith in Jesus Christ. And to that end, it constantly contends with the lukewarm faith of those who play around with the idea of following Jesus, who say, I want the blessings of the kingdom, but I shirk the responsibilities of the kingdom. And James constantly pokes at that with a very pointed stick. And so James has been speaking to us about not just listening to God's word, but doing what it says. He's been talking to us about having integrity, about not just having faith, but living out our faith day by day in, in what we say and how we say it, in living a good life full of many deeds done in the humility that comes from godly wisdom. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week. And I know that last week we were supposed to cover from th verse 13 to 18 of the previous chapter, chapter 3, but by God's providence we really only got to 17, so we're going to start with chapter 3 verse 18 today we're going to go down to 4 chapter uh, chapter 4 verse 10 and but here in verse 18 we see James purposely reminding us what authentic faith and godly wisdom need to look like in our lives that we might see this because just as he made a comparison before he's making another comparison here and he begins he says peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness that's an interesting phrase, a harvest of righteousness. We should be able, James says, to say as King David said, surely goodness and love shall follow me all the days of my life. Meaning that we need to be able to live so that when we look back over our, the course of our lives and we see the thread of our lives woven by the Lord's hand, we can see a long history of good and helpful things that we've done as God's disciple. As God's disciple, as God's own. That how we've helped others, how we've blessed others, how we've honored God in all that we've said and all that we've done, how we've treated those he made in his image. Because that's what God would have all of his people to do. That we would have this impact over the course of our lives that brings honor and glory to his name. Because we do these things because we're made in his image and we call on his name. And so we have this harvest, and righteousness is the fitting and actually inevitable result of the Christ life. Because we who have peace with God through Jesus Christ, we sow that peace, we plant it in the lives of others by what we say and how we say it, and we looked at that two weeks ago, and by how we live our lives, and we looked at that last week. And James says if we do those things, if we have authentic faith and we live out that authentic faith, then the result is inevitable. It's going to happen. Notice he doesn't say, he doesn't say peacemakers who sow in peace might possibly raise a harvest to righteousness if everyone is nice to them and it all goes well. He doesn't say that. He says peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness, period. The NSAB says... The, the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, friends, it's not yet spring, but we all know that we sow what we reap. If you sow seeds of corn, if you plant kernels of corn in the ground, you're going to get corn. It's not rocket science. If you sow seeds of beans, you're going to get beans. You're not going to get fruit if you plant vegetables, and you're not going to get vegetables if you plant fruit. You get what you reap. This is, this is a straightforward thing. We can see this. This is how it works in our lives. And if you and I sow the gospel in what we say and how we say it, if we sow the gospel in how we live our lives, if we sow the gospel in the good deeds done in humility, then we reap a harvest accordingly. Praise the Lord. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. And that's great news if you've been sowing the gospel by what you say and how you say it, and by how you've lived your lives. That's great news. It's wonderful news. But you know, not everyone sows the gospel in peace. And consequently, not everyone reaps a harvest of righteousness. This is a sad and honest fact. I remember being a brand new Christian, coming into, coming into I, I got saved out of a religious vacuum. I knew nothing. I knew nothing of the Bible, nothing of church, nothing of any of that stuff. And I had 
heard the gospel, the spirit had fallen on me, and I got saved. And, and I talked to the person who led me to Christ. I had all these questions. And one of my questions was, well, what is church? And they said, oh, church is great. It's the gathering of those who follow Jesus Christ. I said, well, I'm gonna, I, I, that's, that's fantastic. And so I understood then that the church was full of people who loved God. And I understood that those people loved each other because they knew that each other was made in the image of God, was saved by God, that they were all forgiven sinners. And just as God loves us, we love each other, right? And I remember my second Sunday as a Christian walking into the Stony Creek Alliance, this big church, many times the size of this auditorium, six or seven hundred people sitting there. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, look at all these people. And they love each other. They really love each other. I was just blown away by that idea. But as the weeks turned into months, and the months turned into years, I found that some of them didn't. In fact, some of them wouldn't even talk to each other. The ones that would sit on this side, they never even talked to the ones that... In fact, the reason they're sitting there is because they didn't want to talk to those people over there. I remember that. That blew my mind. And as I grew in Christ, I realized that the problems that James addresses here in this epistle are sadly still problems in God's people, even today. In fact, I can tell you a more recent story. When Deb and I were down Windsor Way, we made fast and good friends with a wonderful couple. And I'm not going to tell you their names because I don't want to, I don't want to do that right now. So for the purpose of this message, I'm going to call them X and Y. These are real people that Deb and I know very well. Well, about a year after we started attending the church where we met them, X was called of God to go lead a small congregation a little bit west of where I wound up serving the Lord in Essex. They were about a half an hour down the road. So Deb and I were serving in Essex, and X and Y were serving over uh, some distance down the road the other way. But we both lived in McGregor area, and so they would get up from their, from their house in the Sunday morning and they would drive west and we would get up and we would drive east to each of our churches. And by the grace of God and the ministry of Christ through them, over the next two years, X and before we got here, X and Y saw their little tiny congregation grow very significantly, several orders of magnitude. It was fantastic. And I was very happy for them and Deb was very happy for them. And all who knew them and looked on were very happy. But bizarrely, not everyone in that congregation was happy. There were a few who took exception to what was happening. All these new people coming in, and some people didn't like that. They didn't like the new direction. And I know that caused X and Y a great deal of stress, and, and, and X would call me from time to time, and we still speak from time to time, and pray about that. Well, a few weeks ago, he called again. And he told me about a recent congregational meeting, a business meeting at his church, where accusations flew and heated arguments arose and shouting erupted and people had to be held back. And I wish I could report to you that when he told me that, that I was shocked. I wish I could report to you that he was shocked, that no one had ever seen or heard of such a thing happening in a church. But the history of the Church of Jesus Christ is littered with similar instances. World over, in fact. And as he explained what was happening, all I could think about is our study in James, where James says, where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you have disorder and every evil practice. And so it is, to this very day. But James wrote his epistle in what? 40 AD, maybe 45 AD. It's one of the earliest writings in all of the scripture. And so it's just a few decades after Pentecost. And as James addresses this matter in the epistle, because even back then, even just a few decades after the cross, just a few decades since the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the church is already experiencing disorder and every evil practice. Just look at the beginning here of chapter 4. James says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, because you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think, the scripture says without reason, 
that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely. Wow. Wow, that's quite a list there. Fighting, quarreling, murder, coveting, wrong motives, self-indulgence, adultery, hatred toward God, friendship with the enemies of God. One might assume that God would look at that and say, well, you know what, I'm just going to, we're just going to wash those people away and start over. That he would simply label them heretics and be done with it. But God does not abandon his people. Not on even on account of such human foolishness. Our gracious and merciful Lord has a solution to discord in every evil practice. He has a solution to these things. Let's pick it up at verse 6. It says, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Repentance, friends, is by the grace of God. By the grace of God. James quotes Proverbs 3, which says, he mocks the proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. God gives that much grace. Grace, he graciously hands, he pours it out upon his people, all who ask for it. The NSAB says he gives a greater grace. You know, we received grace when we called on the name of the Lord for salvation, when we got saved, and we receive again his continuing grace whenever we turn to him and ask for his forgiveness. Praise the Lord. By his grace, we can and we must turn back to him. But notice the condition that James says, the prerequisite. He says we have to have humility. God opposes the proud. He stands against the proud. He mocks the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And that's because in order to turn from wickedness, one must first be willing to bow the knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Submit yourselves then to God, James says. We have to submit to Him, to agree that He is right and that we are wrong. And that's going to take humility. But you know, you and I who have called on the name of Christ, we know that we can do that all the same because we've already done it once, haven't we? We've done it at least once when we bowed our heads and called on the name of Jesus Christ for salvation, and we can do it again. Not calling on salvation per se, but calling for forgiveness all the same because the Scripture says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise the Lord. Jesus is faithful. Jesus is just. Jesus will always honor His name and do what He's promised to do in His name. But you know, when you and I think about that, even as we, even as we go to repent, the devil suggests we hesitate. So James says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He will flee, it says. He, but you don't have to beat him back with a hockey stick. You don't have to shoot at him with bullets. You just put up a little bit of resistance, and you say, no, I refuse to listen to the devil's advice. I choose to believe the word of God, and he will flee. You know, all the armor of God is defensive except the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So if we resist the devil on that basis, he is gone like the wind. Praise the Lord. Not that we should then stand there on our own, having, having overcome temptation, but that we might pursue restoration. James says, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Elsewhere in Scripture we read, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Malachi 3.7. Zechariah 1 says, this is what the Lord Almighty says, return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. So it's three times in Scripture at least that God says this. It's a, it's a fact. It's a, it, you can guarantee this. This is a hard reality that is not going to change. We turn to God, God turns to us. We draw near to God, and God draws near to us. To us, Matthew Henry said, The heart that has rebelled must be brought to the foot of God. The spirit that was distant and estranged from a life of communion with God must become reacquainted with Him. And truly, friends, this is the grace of God that though we have fallen so far, yet restoration and fellowship and communion with God is but one act of repentance away. But one act 
of repentance away. Think of Peter on the shoreline having denied Christ three times. Just one act of repentance and he's restored. Though you and I may have fallen so far, restoration is possible and restoration is much desired on the part of Christ. He says, return to me and I will return to you. That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all of our sin. Glory to God. God is always ready to pour out His grace upon us. That is all of His. That's all of His work. It's all of the work of the Holy Spirit. But friends, you and I have a part to play in it too. We must humble ourselves before Him. We must humble ourselves before Him. James says, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. And I'm compelled again to tell you and remind you that James is writing to God's people. He's writing to the church, to fellow believers, to brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. He isn't writing to the unsaved in the market square as Peter did, or to those who know nothing of Jesus as Paul did in the synagogues when he preached around Asia Minor. James is writing to God's people, to those he repeatedly calls my brothers and sisters. Verse 2 of chapter 1. And verse 16 again. My dear brothers and sisters. Again in verse 19 of chapter 1. Chapter 2 verse 1. My brothers and sisters. Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5 of chapter 2. My dear brothers and sisters. Verse 14. My brothers and sisters. Verse 15. Suppose a brother or a sister. Verse 1 of chapter 3. My fellow believers. Verse 10. My brothers and sisters. Verse 12. My brothers and sisters. Over and over and over again, he's re, 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 we're being reminded he's writing to us. He's writing to the church. And yet he accuses. He accuses them of fighting and of quarreling, of murder, coveting, wrong motives, self-indulgence, adultery, hatred toward God, friendship with the world, and becoming enemies of God. And questions arise in our minds. How, how can this even be? How can that come about? How can it be that God's people would stoop so low and sin so obviously? I testify to you that the Scripture is very clear. That we who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit applies at that point, at that very moment, the blood of Christ, which frees us forever from the penalty of sin. Praise the Lord. And frees us from the power of sin. Absolutely. Because by the deposit of the Spirit in us, we, we can reject sin. And we know at the same time that on account of Christ's work on the cross, we will one day be free of the presence of sin. But you and I can look around the world and look around ourselves and know that we are not yet free of the presence of sin. Free of the penalty right away, free of the power of sin right away, but not free of the presence right away. Free of the penalty of sin by the work of Christ Jesus on the cross, free of the power of sin on account of the Holy Spirit that God gives us, who has power to overcome sin, to free us of our temptations, to enable us to turn from sin and live holy lives. So that's true, all true. But we're not yet free of the presence of sin. Now, it's true that our spirits are, are made new. We're perfect, as 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Glory to God. Our spirits are remade, brand new, to replace the dead spirit on us that we had on account of our sin. We get a new spirit the moment we call on to Christ for salvation. If you've called on the name of Jesus Christ, you have a new spirit within you that is holy and that is perfect and that is blameless before God on account of your position as being in Christ. In the spiritual realm, we're already perfect, even though we are not yet fully holy. Hebrews 10.14 says, By one sacrifice, He, Jesus, has made perfect forever those 
who are being made holy. He has made, past tense, perfect forever, those who are being made holy, present tense. Scripture tells us that we are holy and perfect in spirit, but yet being made holy, holy with the rest of us. Praise the Lord that we can be made holy because our souls are redeemed. Galatians says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Glory to God. Our spirits are made new. Our souls are redeemed, rescued from the penalty of sin. But our bodies, not yet. Not yet. Our physical selves are not made new just yet. We're still physically who we were when we called on the name of Christ. And you and I know that because when we open our eyes after calling on His name in prayer... We were not glowing with glory. We were not radiating glory. But Jesus Christ will yet have us fully holy, body, mind, and spirit. Which is why the scripture promises all who call on the name of Christ, saying, in the same way with the resurrection of the dead, our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to to, to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The scriptures say the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, and then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, heavenly people like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be made like the heavenly man. Glory to God. Which means that on account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which we celebrate on Easter, we will one day have a body like His resurrected body. Because God has sown into your flesh, into your body, a new spirit. And friends, God will reap what He sowed to. God will reap what He sowed to. And because He sowed a new spirit into you, God will reap a perfect person from the perfect spirit that He sowed into your flesh back when you got saved, when you called on His name for salvation. And that that fact gives us hope. That fact gives us hope, and we celebrate that hope every Easter Sunday. We celebrate that hope every time we celebrate the new covenant that He gave us. Yet for now, our spirits and souls remain in this present body, which is perishable, because even the best of us still die. We still die. Our physical bodies, in fact, must die because they are dishonored by sin. They are unspiritual. They are natural of the dust of the earth and so return to dust. Dust to dust, as we say at funerals. And So though our spirit is holy and though our soul is redeemed, the body of dust we inhabit always wants to do what the world wants to do because it's made of the earth. Our flesh wants to do earthly things. Our normal way of living in our bodies is to dishonor our Lord. That's why our bodies constantly cry out for physical food. Your body never says, hey, you should read the Bible. No, your your spirit will say that. The Holy Spirit might tell you that. Your mind might think that, but your body's not saying, oh, please read the Bible. No, your body just wants physical food, not spiritual food. That's why if we're left entirely to how we feel, we would never come to church. We would never say, I need to go to church and worship Jesus Christ with the rest of God's people. Praise the Lord. I don't need, I want to come to church and serve God's people. Well, our bodies won't say that. Coming to church, praying, serving Jesus Christ, all these acts of spiritual discipline, they're acts of discipline. Our minds and our spirits overruling our bodies. Because our bodies would be happy just to lie at home. Maybe eat some snacks, have some salt, and have some sugar. Well, my body, anyway. I don't believe. But you know, worse than that, our, 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 you know, most of us followed the way of the world for some period of time before we got saved. You know, I got saved when I was 22, which means that for over two decades, 
I followed the way of the world before I got saved. And some of you had more. Some of you got saved in your 30s, 40s, 50s, later perhaps. Which means that coming into the kingdom, our bodies had decades of training in doing what they want. Because we didn't have a new spirit. Our spirit was dead on account of our sin. And our minds were not redeemed. And so we did what we wanted, what we thought was good. And so we trained our bodies in sin. And that's a problem because now that we're saved, all the training that our body had, all that practice that we had, uh, means that our flesh has been trained to do what it wants without even thinking. I was talking to a brother in Christ about that just the other week. Our bodies aren't sinners just by nature. They've been schooled in sin. So our natural predisposition of being made from the dust of the earth is towards sin, and our naturally gained bodily disposition is towards sin. And for this reason, we all mess up from time to time, even though we're now saved. As James says, we all stumble in many ways. Praise Christ, less so as we gain maturity in Christ, but while here on earth, still. And you and I know that because from time to time we stumble. In spite of everything we know, in spite of all the years we've been serving Christ, in spite of having just had our daily devotions, we'll turn and we'll see something and we'll blurt something out or we'll, we'll make an offhand comment and we'll fail as Christ followers. We argue where grace should be extended. We fight where unity should prevail. We kill fresh ideas and godly initiatives in the name of tradition and out of unrighteous jealousy what we should have long discarded. We accept and apply worldly ideas to our walk with Christ and then wonder why our prayers go unanswered and our spiritual lives show so little fruitfulness. But praise the Lord, God is gracious still. God is gracious. To, he does not abandon us to our corruption. Instead, He comes to us and He says, you just need to repent. You just need to repent. You need to turn from that. Stop sinning and turn to Him. And He will turn to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. Friends, to repent is to humble ourselves before the Lord. To cleanse our bodies. Wash our hands, as James puts it. And to cleanse our hearts. Well, washing our hands and be freeing, uh, being free of dust and dirt, we can do that, right? We all know how to take a shower, praise the Lord. But to cleanse our hearts, to cleanse our hearts to be free of sin, well, that's a much harder thing. How do we do that? You know, we can't do that. But the Holy Spirit can. The Holy Spirit can. And friends, He will. He will if we humble ourselves before Him. You know, one day, when my son Kyle passed last November, when he was very young, I think he was four, and we lived in Hamilton, I was and we lived near Gage Park, which is a big downtown park, and I had got him a new tricycle for his fourth birthday, just a few days earlier, and I was planning on, on, on that Saturday taking him to the park so he could ride his tricycle on the trails there, and it was a beautiful Saturday morning. Beautiful Saturday morning. And he was born in June, so it was nice and warm. It was a beautiful day. And I was really, really looking forward to spending the day outside with my son while he rode his new tricycle, pedaling around on the trail there. The trouble was that Kyle wasn't very cooperative that day. He was four. What do you expect? A tantrum when I picked him up for the day. A tantrum when we got to my place. A tantrum when I asked him to put his shoes on so we could go outside. So I told him, Kyle, we're not going to go outside and ride your bike until you apologize for being so disrespectful. But he was having none of it. He had no intention of apologizing. So we, we didn't go. He had to stay inside and color or play with his blocks 
and I watch the sun outside and people walking by enjoying the sun and the hours ticked by. And I grieved inside. After a long time, he turned to me and he mumbled under his breath, sorry. But I could tell he wasn't. And I so wanted to take him to the park. Oh, I wanted to. It was such a beautiful day, and I had looked forward to it all week. But as his father, I could not allow myself to be manipulated by a four-year-old. And so I looked at his stubborn face, and I recalled the conversation that my parents had had with me when I was small and acted that way. And so I, I looked in his eyes, and I said, Kyle, you have to mean it. If you have kids, you've probably had the same conversation with them. We've all been there. And when we were young, we could not fool our parents into thinking we were sorry when we weren't. And my son could not fool me into thinking he was sorry when he wasn't. And God is not going to be fooled into thinking we are sorry if we aren't. Because God cannot be manipulated. He cannot be. So look again at his advice. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You know, later that afternoon, Kyle turned to me again, and this time he had a tear in his eye. And he said, sorry. And I instantly knew he actually was sorry. And though it was mid-afternoon by that time, I picked him up. And I grabbed his tricycle, and we went to the park. And you know what? We had a great day that afternoon. We had a great day in the park, that very day. And God is gracious, and he will do the same for us. He will do the same for us. You know, immediately after I close this message, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. But two applications coming out of this message. Firstly, there might be some here, there might be someone here who has not yet come into relationship with Jesus Christ, who has not taken that very first step of faith. And friend, if that is you, you have to know that Christ has sent you here. You may have come here thinking, I will go there, and it was all of you, but it wasn't. God was drawing you here, and God has drawn you here for this purpose that you would begin a relationship with him, that you would turn to him in repentance and find your sins washed away by Jesus Christ, that you would know God as your Father in heaven. So if you have not committed your life to Christ yet, bow with me and pray. Father, you know I have sinned. You know my sin. And I know, Lord, that you are gracious and merciful Father in heaven, you sent Jesus Christ to take the punishment of my sin, to die for me, to wash away all my sins, everything I've ever done to offend you, all the shame and all the guilt that I've ever heaped upon myself. Lord, forgive me and receive me to yourself. Forgive me for how I have disrespected you, Lord. I confess my sin to you, knowing you are faithful and just and will forgive my sins and purify me from all unrighteousness. I call on Jesus Christ for salvation. Be my Savior, Lord Jesus, and be my Lord, my God, from this moment on and evermore. I give my life to you. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that as of this moment you are saved. Because the scripture says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth you confess and are saved. And friends, because you're now part of the family of God, you can partake of the Lord's Supper with us without guilt, without shame, and without condemnation. Glory to God. Make sure you tell someone about your decision to follow Christ before you leave this room. Don't forget. Tell someone else. Testify of your new faith in Christ.
before you leave this room. Another application for all of us who are already in Christ then. For the rest, for all of us who have called on His name. Because we know that a message on repentance is literally the best possible lead up to celebrating the Lord's Supper. Because Scripture exhorts us saying, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone then ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many are weak and sick and a number have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. So if you've already called on the name of Jesus Christ, I'm going to invite you to stand with me and pray. Father, we come to you today mindful that none of us are perfect. We come to you convicted through this message. And we stand before you this morning in fallen flesh, in bodies that are aging, in bodies that are failing, and that ever remind us that, well, we are this side of heaven, we are yet not perfect. We still speak foolishly from time to time. We still act selfishly from time to time. And none of us have honored you perfectly as you rightly deserve to be honored. And we all stumble in many ways. Father, forgive us. Father, forgive us as you forgive all by the grace and of the work of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whom we trust. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to ask those passing out the, the, the elements today to come forward. And as the tray and as the cup reach you, I want you to take one piece of cracker and one cup and hold them to yourself. Do not take them right away. Hold them to yourself. Pass the tray on. And then we will all partake together when we all have been served. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wound, His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Praise the 
I invite you to hold the element of the bread in your hand. Paul wrote, I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat. Lord, we thank you for your body broken for us. We thank you for the stripes that you endured. We thank you for the beatings that you took. We thank you, Father God, that you received such humiliation for us. So we humble ourselves before you and we say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the sacrifice you made for us. Amen. I'm going to hand out the elements to you. Juice now. Paul also wrote, in the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, covenant under which all the sins that we had under the old covenant are washed away. Do this, he said, whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us partake together. Lord, how thankful we are for your sacrifice. How thankful we are, Lord God, for what you've done for us. How thankful we are for the body and the blood of Christ Jesus. 
And we remember you now, Lord, and we remember your sacrifice for us, and we rejoice, Lord, that you have done such things for us. Father, help us, Lord God. Help us to be a blessing and to likewise serve and help selflessly all those that we come across. For you are worthy to receive the praise and the honor of our lives. In Christ's name we give you praise. Amen. Let's worship.